On January 23rd, 2017, this channel had exactly 150 subscribers. But in less than three months, that number grew by over 10,000% to 16,000 subscribers by the end of April. So how did I grow my channel so fast? We'll get into that later in the video. But what's interesting to note is that not every profession can just grow by 10,000%. If you are a doctor or a dentist, you can only see so many patients in a certain time frame. Even if there is an epidemic and a surplus of sick people to treat, you're fundamentally limited by the number of people you can treat each day. The same goes for hairstylists, shoe shiners, Uber drivers, bakers, tax accountants. Work is largely predictable because income is directly related to how much time you work. But then there are scalable professions which aren't limited by physical or mental energy. Think of an investor. With the same mental effort, an investor can buy either 500 shares of a stock or 500,000 shares of a stock. It just means pressing a different button. The same goes for writers, recording artists, thinkers, filmmakers. Once you make a film, it takes essentially the same amount of effort to draw in one viewer as it does to draw in one million viewers. Unlike a food truck chef who has to make a new meal for every hungry customer that stops by, a filmmaker doesn't have to refilm a movie for every person that wants to watch it. So if you're an ambitious person, why would you not choose a scalable career? With non-scalable careers, you can only earn more with more hours, more work, more stress. And with a scalable career, you can receive unlimited rewards with only a finite amount of work. Well, here's the problem. That's what a scalable career looks like if you're successful. And it's really, really hard to be successful. In scalable industries, rewards follow a power law distribution which means there's a huge gap between effort and reward, leaving many talented people with little to their name for no good reason at all. Compare that to doctors and bakers, where rewards follow more of a normal distribution. Although there's inequality, most of the herd is rewarded in a similar way. Even though scalable professions today are quite unfair in terms of how people get rewarded, it wasn't always like that. Imagine it's the mid-1800s and you are a talented concert pianist in France. You play in a county far outside the city, and you don't have to worry about the talented pianists in Paris, because when Saturday night comes, they have their audiences, and you have yours. There's no way they could play in two places at once, so although they may draw a slightly larger crowd in their metropolis, competition is small, and the inequality that exists between you and other pianists is mild. Now, fast forward to the invention of the gramophone and the first music recording, and suddenly the entire game has changed. People don't need a live pianist in their presence anymore to listen to piano music. Someone like Arthur Rubinstein, the talented Polish-American pianist, can come along and record Chopin's Nocturnes. And anyone in the world can listen to that music whenever they want, wherever they want. All of the talented pianists that once had an audience in their respective counties are left with no ears to listen to them play. And with the help of the music recording, Rubinstein didn't just put his peers out of business. He also ruined the opportunity for all future concert pianists that will come after his death. After all, who would pay for a recording of Chopin's Nocturnes by some very talented but unknown graduate of the Juilliard School today when they can just buy the version that the great Arthur Rubinstein recorded for an equal price? This unfairness didn't just start with the gramophone though, it began even earlier with the printing press. Storytellers and thinkers who were once able to share their ideas with live audiences in marketplaces and squares now had to compete for readers through print and those writers who, for whatever reason, got more attention on the start, quickly stole eyeballs away from their equally talented peers. This means that a few take home the whole entire pie, and the majority of other talented people are left with just the crumbs. What's more unfair is that those who get lucky in the beginning of their career don't just reap the benefits once. That luck compounds over and over again for the rest of their life in a positive feedback loop. In 1968, sociologist Robert K. Merton realized that when multiple scientists collaborated on research, the most famous and established scientist who authored the paper, even if listed as a second or third author, would get a disproportionate amount of credit for the work, while the other scientists would receive a disproportionately small amount of credit. He found the same thing to occur when two scientists of different fame made the same discovery independently. The more established scientists will get more credit, leading to more fame and more prestige. Merton called this the Matthew effect, which comes from Matthew 25, 29 of the New Testament. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken, even that which he hath. Translating that into English, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and really the famous get more famous. So people who have a lucky break early on in their career will enter a positive feedback loop that gives them more opportunities, a bigger audience, and continuous cumulative advantage for the rest of their life. And also, a longer life.
Sir Michael Marmot, who led the famous Whitehall studies, found that in the British civil servants, those who had a higher rank had a lower risk of death later in life. Also, in Hollywood, actors who win an Oscar live an average of four more years than actors of similar talent who do not win an Academy Award. A moment ago, I mentioned that those who have a lucky head start in their career get far ahead of their peers due to cumulative advantage. But how do we know it comes from luck and not skill or talent? Economist Art Devaney, who studied the mechanics of the Hollywood film industry, found that it's not an actor's talent that makes a film successful, but rather it's a highly successful film that solidifies our perceived talent of an actor. And what makes a film successful? It seems to be a lot of nonlinear luck, like other creative works. In a study performed by Salganik, Dodds, and Watts, researchers took over 14,000 participants and led them to a music downloading website with over 40 previously unknown songs. The first half of participants had the ability to listen to any song, rate it on a scale of one to five stars, and also download it if they liked. With this independent group, the researchers were able to assess the quality of each song by looking at each song's download rates. When the second half of participants visited the website, though, they did the same thing but also had the ability to see how many other participants from their group had downloaded each song on the website as well, similar to how you can see how many other people have listened to a song on SoundCloud. And in this group, where the social influence of strangers' music taste was present, the number of downloads each song had did not match the quality of that song as rated by the independent reviewers. Good songs often had few downloads, and bad songs often had many downloads. And that's all in a simulated environment without the effects of mass marketing, critics' opinions, and media attention. We would like to believe that we fall in love with art and other creative works for their merit alone, but that's simply not the case. A huge reason we enjoy any creative work is to fit in with the peers around us who also enjoy that creative work. We give up some of our independent taste in order to fit in with the community. When I started this video, I told you that I would let you know how I grew my YouTube channel by over 10,000%. So how did I do it? Was it my good looks? Or was it my secret growth hacking techniques that I learned on marketing websites to drive a lot of traffic to my video? Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. Was it just optimizing my keywords of my video and making all the titles and the descriptions and everything perfect for the YouTube algorithm? No, it was none of those things. It was actually something completely out of my control. It was a video somebody else made of a physical robot bypassing Google's I'm not a robot recaptcha. It went viral and made it to the YouTube homepage shortly after being uploaded. At the time, I had made one of the few videos on YouTube talking about this topic. And so, after users watched the trending video of the robot, my I'm not a robot video happened to be featured at the top of the suggested videos tab. A fraction of the first viewers trickled down to my video, and from there, the rest was history. Tom from the YouTube channel Syndicate tweeted my video out to his over 2 million Twitter followers. Redditor Donny Gan posted my video in the r slash videos subreddit, where it trended as the 18th top video of the day. Psh very small YouTuber. Come on, dude. Today, my video has over 1 million views, and while Tom's tweet and the Reddit post were really useful in attracting traffic to my video, they were really secondary effects to the viral video of the robot. And so I credit my channel's growth in large parts to an event which was completely outside my control, an event completely due to luck. However, if I ended my video here, you might think that now the odds are more against you than ever, or you might think that there's little you can do to advance your position as a creative, but both of those ideas are false. Today, the internet allows anyone to share anything for free. It doesn't matter if you're a grandma, if you're 14 years old, if you only have $6 to your name. And in this sense, I think things are more fair than they've ever been. As for what you can do to advance your position, you can start by making things that are high quality. Back in the music downloading study, which I mentioned earlier, although there is little correlation between the quality of a song and the number of downloads it received, there is one thing that the researchers did point out. The worst songs rarely did the best, and the best songs rarely did the worst. So if you're gonna make something, make something you're proud of, make something that's good. And lastly, you shouldn't just make and create for the chance of becoming successful. You should make and create because having an idea and turning that idea into something real, something tangible, is probably the most beautiful process there is. You should make and create because you can. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, be sure to check out a book by Nassim Taleb called The Black Swan. I was influenced by that book to make this video, 
and really as a whole it contains a lot more information about randomness, chance, society, history, cognitive biases. Otherwise, if you have any questions about this topic, feel free to leave it in the comment section below. And with that, I will see you next time on Zuck That.